In God's light, we see light. A single candle lit in heart or hand restores hope. Welcome everyone to this online Sunday service from Bentley Uniting Church in Melbourne. We gather as a scattered community, connected by the light of God's spirit. We gather in spirit, in the name of the God of hope. We gather to build hope and community among us. This prayer. Loving spirit of God, help us to see ourselves as you do. Help us to see how hope connects us, connects us to the deepest wellsprings of our existence and to all that is most sacred. Good spirit of hope, let us call on hope each day of our lives. Let us live hopefully. Let us recognise each new moment of possibility and welcome it bravely. Strong and gentle spirit, help us to remember that darkness and despair will pass. Help us to remember that dawn will come again. Help us to remember that in your liberating love, we are affirmed and blessed, forgiven and renewed. May we live this day in the strength and peace of your abundant love. This is our prayer. Amen. We come to our scriptures for this morning. All of our scriptures testify to God's power to bring life from utter hopelessness. At this time, we may feel in the depths, but in today's psalm, we hear of waiting with our whole being, waiting for the morning, and as we wait, putting our hope and trust in God's steadfast love. I read to you Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Eternal One. God, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice, my cries for mercy. If you kept track of our misdeeds, Eternal One, who could stand before you? But with you is forgiveness. And for this, we revere you. So I wait for you, Eternal One. My soul waits. And in your word, I place my trust. My soul longs for you, eternal one, more than sentinels long for the dawn. Yes, more than sentinels long for the dawn. Israel, put your hope in the eternal one. For with God is abundant love and the fullness of deliverance. God will deliver Israel from all its failings. Psalm 130. Today's passage from the prophet Ezekiel was written in the period around the Babylonian exile, after 597 BCE. Now Ezekiel was evidently among those citizens taken off to Babylon into exile, away from their home and all the familiar structures of their lives a time of isolation and hardship. The passage begins with a kind of vision where the breath of God makes alive again the dry and dead bones that are scattered in a forgotten valley. They're the bones of a defeated army, of a people now dominated by a foreign empire. We're assured that God can act. God can act to restore life, to restore life and hope to a devastated people. I read to you from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of God, the Eternal One, came upon me, and it carried me away by the Spirit of God and set me down in a valley, a valley full of bones. God led me all around them, and I saw that there was a vast number of bones lying there in the valley, and they were very dry. God asked me, 
mortal? Can these bones live? I answered, Only you know that, sovereign God. And God said, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of God, the eternal one. The sovereign God says to these bones, I am going to breathe life into you. I will fasten sinews on you, clothe you with flesh, cover you with skin and give you breath, and you will live, and you will know that I am the sovereign God. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied, and as I was prophesying, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and all the bones came together, bone to matching bone. As I watched, sinews appeared on them, flesh clothed them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, Prophesy to the breath, to the wind of spirit. Prophesy, mortal, and say to it, Thus says the sovereign God, Come from the four winds, breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath came into them. They came alive and stood up on their feet, a vast multitude. Then God said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The people keep saying, Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are doomed. Prophesy, therefore, and say to them, Thus says the sovereign God, I am going to open your graves and raise you up from the dead, my people. I will return you to the land of Israel. When I open your graves and raise you up, you my people, you will know that I am God, the Eternal One. Then I will put my spirit within you, and you will live, and I will settle you back on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Eternal One, have spoken and will act, says the Sovereign God. Ezekiel 37 We come to the Gospel reading for today. In today's reading from the Gospel storyteller John, Jesus, on hearing of Lazarus' illness, returns after a short delay to Judea, risking his own death in order to raise Lazarus. After proclaiming himself as the resurrection and life, Jesus raises Lazarus, and many people come as a result to believe in him. I read to you from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 45. There was a certain man named Lazarus who was sick. He and his sisters, Mary and Martha, were from the village of Bethany. Mary was the one who had anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and dried his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. The sisters sent this message to Jesus. Rabbi, the one you love, is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. It is happening for God's glory, so that God's only begotten may be glorified because of it. Jesus loved these three very much. Yet even after hearing that Lazarus was sick, He remained where he was staying for two more days. Then, after this, Jesus said to the disciples, Let's go back to to Judea. They protested, Rabbi, it was only recently that they tried to stone you, and you want to go back there again? Jesus replied, Aren't there twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk by day don't stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After Jesus said this, he said to the disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, 
I'm going to Judea to awaken, to awaken him. The disciples objected. But Rabbi, if he's only asleep, he'll be fine. Jesus, however, had been speaking about Lazarus's death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sakes, I'm glad that I wasn't there, that you might come to believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, the twin, said to the rest, Let's go with Jesus so that we can die with him. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Since Bethany was only about two miles from Jerusalem, many people had come out to console Martha and Mary about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary stayed at home with the mourners. When she got to Jesus, Martha said, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet, even now, I am sure that God will give you whatever you ask. Your brother will rise again, Jesus assured her. Martha replied, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Martha replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the anointed one, God's only begotten the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, Martha went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and he's calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up and went to him. Jesus had not yet come to the village but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Those who were there consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary got to Jesus, she knelt at his feet and said, If you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the other mourners as well, he was greatly troubled in spirit moved by the deepest emotions. Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, they said. And Jesus wept. The people in the crowd began to remark, see how much he loved him. Others said, He made the blind person see. Why couldn't he have done something to prevent Lazarus' death? Jesus was again deeply moved. They approached the tomb, which was a cave with a stone in front of it. Take away the stone, Jesus directed. Martha said, Rabbi, it has been four days now. By this time, there will be a stench. Jesus replied, Didn't I assure you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Jesus looked upward and said, Abba God, thank you for having heard me. I know you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, still bound hand and foot with linen strips and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus told the crowd, unbind him 
and let him go free. Many of those who had come to console Martha and Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. These scriptures are words of faith. Thanks be to God. I now offer this reflection. On September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers of New York City's World Trade Center were attacked, some of the students on their way to the Churchill School were up close eyewitnesses to the disaster. One of the students came up to his teacher and said, all I know is I need a hug. The teacher gave him a hug and then she gave him a teddy bear, a teddy bear to hold. At that moment, the teacher became the bear lady. All the other children in the class said they wanted a teddy bear too, but there were only three bears. So the bear lady teacher promised that if the children shared these three bears, on the next day she would bring a bear for each of them. And that's what she did. Then another class asked for bears. Very soon the whole school wanted bears to hug. And then, as word spread, other schools called. During the weeks after 9-11, the bear lady teacher and her church friends handed out more than 58,000, 58,000 teddy bears to the children in New York City. On 9-11, when the Twin Towers fell, there was great sadness, fear and distress across New York City. But all these teddy bears, symbols of love and care, of hope and goodwill, helped to heal the hurt and lift the spirits of New York children. A powerful goodness. A powerful goodness that prevailed, bringing comfort, courage and hope, despite the terrible destruction that had befallen the city. I was reminded of this story when this past week I went for a walk around our Bentley neighbourhood. I encountered numerous homes with teddy bears propped on fences in front windows and on doorsteps. Symbols of hope and solidarity in our community at this time of fear and uncertainty as the world endeavours to combat the coronavirus pandemic. Our scripture readings this week echo the feelings of many of us that many of us may be feeling right now. Many, I know, are doing it tough with the restrictions on social contacts and others are facing hardships, hardships brought about by business closures and job loss. For so many people right now, hope can seem hard to find. Yet, as we listen to the psalmist and the stories of Ezekiel and Lazarus, we hear that God enters the hardest times and brings hope. Into the valley of dry bones, God speaks the message of hope, that life will come from the very place where only death is expected, that the scattered dry bones will be reunited in such a way that new life will result. Ezekiel's vision in the valley of dry bones remind us that we are not just bones and muscles, but also bearers of God's spirit. God breathes into the enlivened bodies the wind of spirit. The people embody God's life-giving spirit presence. In the story of Lazarus, we hear that from out of the tomb comes new life. It is a story of the power of life over death, the power over all that demeans and destroys human life. Jesus assures Martha, I am the resurrection and I am life. Martha recognises that Jesus is the Christ of God who will lift us up and show us the way to fullness of life. It is eternal life, sharing the life of God here and now and forever. 
In this story, there is also recognition that sorrow and pain are a part of human experience. In response to the grief and sorrow he encounters among the mourners, Jesus was deeply moved, troubled in spirit, and wept. The God of love is with us in our pain, our fears, our distress, our difficulties. God so loved the world. God is compassion, abundant love. There is indeed a time for sorrow, as we see in the Lazarus story. Yet as we are comforted, we are drawn onwards, drawn onwards to discover hope. In today's psalm, we hear of waiting with our whole being, waiting for the morning. And as we wait, putting our hope and trust in God's steadfast love. We can hold to hope even in the darkest valleys. We can know that renewal is possible, that the light of life is stronger than the darkness. It's a powerful message of reassurance for communities that have lost hope, then and now. Even in the midst of what seems like insurmountable destruction, God's Spirit can bring renewal and transformation. And God's people can be mobilised to be carriers of hope and to enact renewal. Currently, we're all needing to give up aspects of our regular day-to-day lives, our various community activities and social gatherings. I wonder, amidst this disruption to our lives, What new opportunities might arise for us? Opportunities to support and connect with others. What might God be seeking to do through us and in our lives as we remain in this very different space for a time? Just as Lazarus entered the tomb, just as the dry bones were scattered before they came back together in new life, I wonder... How might God be preparing us for the new things ahead? Even in the depths of dry, dark and dead places, places of drought, bushfire and deadly pandemic, the spirit presence of God renews and brings hope and life. Many of you will have seen the news coverage of Clap for Carers, tributes across the world from China to Italy to Spain to Britain to the United States to Peru. Communities of people clapping from balconies and windows, from doorsteps and doorways, uniting in support and gratitude. And beyond the fear we saw reflected in panic buying in our supermarkets and stores, we've also seen generosity Generosity displayed in acts of kindness, big and small, to support the vulnerable through this tough time. Food boxes donated by restaurants, landlords waiving rent payments. How might we, as bearers of God's good spirit, bring light and love and hope to our community and beyond? Teddy bear symbols of caring and hope on our neighbourhood doorsteps and front gates remind us that we can support one another, however scattered we might be. And together, we can look in hope, look in hope and expectant faith, look toward the promise of that newness of life. And so we come to our prayers for others and for ourselves. This prayer. Loving and compassionate God, you call us to love our neighbours and to be bearers of your hope and grace in our world. Expand our hearts and visions to respond with compassion to those around us, those who are struggling in this time of uncertainty, anxiety, grief, and suffering. Give wisdom and strength to our health workers and government officials as they provide leadership in bringing our country through this crisis. 
We bring before you into our, and into our hearts and minds those whose work and income are uncertain, those who are isolated, those who are fearful of an unknown future, those who live in situations of domestic violence and whose isolation increases the control of their violent partners, those who are homeless and all those who offer them support and care, those who are involved in aged care, our agency leaders, staff and residents and their loved ones. Businesses whose futures are uncertain, their leaders and staff, school staff and students. Those with health conditions that put them at greater risk. Give wisdom and careful discernment to all our church leaders, our councils and local congregations as we seek to creatively live out our worship, witness and service in ways that offer Christ's life-giving love and presence. Strengthen and sustain us to be your people, shaped by your abundant grace, bearers of your generosity and overflowing love, bearers of your good spirit. The light and hope and love of Christ. This is our prayer. Amen. And this blessing. Go forth into a world of dis-ease, yet know that God dwells even there, in all places in this time, Know that we are one in God's oneness. Be aware of that sacred presence. Let it strengthen you. Let it transform you. Build shalom. Love with abandon. Abide in peace.